Good evening, members. Bona apewe sifa. It's uh, 8 p.m. and uh, I want to take this opportunity to welcome us to our Tuesday virtual engagement. This the third of um, the eighth of March, 2022, and tonight we're talking about safe motherhood. I have just also shared the link again, once again, with members. I believe more will be joining as we carry on. So at this juncture, I want to invite our parish minister to say hi to us and also uh, introduce our guest tonight so that we can carry on with our topic. Karibu sana mchungaji, mtufungulia. Asante, thank you very much, our evangelist. We want to welcome all of us uh, today, uh, our virtual engagement. We have our very own uh, Daktari from Ebenezer District, uh, Dr. Peter Igogo, who is a consultant. Obst I, I, I find difficulties in pronouncing the word obstetrician. <laughs> it's a hard name, gynecologist. And we, we want to welcome you, Daktari. Uh, you're one of us and we are happy to use our giftings and talents that we have in our parish. So let us pray as we welcome Daktari. Dear God, our loving Father, we thank you so much for this month that we are looking at health matters. We thank you for the fire you brought us. We want to commit ourselves to you, O oh Lord, even tonight as uh, Dr. Ali speaks to us, that it will help us, O oh Lord, to learn on safe motherhood. Our uh, prayer that God, this will take us to greater heights, even in understanding and also in transformation. We ask that God, you bless us and be with us, for this is our prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Karibu sana, Dr. Um, thank you, Mchungaji, and thank you for the warm welcome. And again, I want to welcome all the members to this engagement this evening. And I want to thank the church and the leadership of our minister for giving me this opportunity to discuss this very important topic. So allow one minute um, for me to share my presentation. So I believe we can see my slide. Um, evangelist, maybe I can communicate through you whether my slides yes, are yes. visible. Yeah, they are. Okay, thank you so much. So, so this evening, I just want us to go through this topic. It's an overview of maternal health in our country, what you call safe motherhood. And it's an important topic for all of us because we know motherhood is key in our community. Again, it's part of my introduction. I'm Dr. Igogo Karanja, an obstetrician gynecologist. I practice in Nairobi and also train young doctors at Jomo Kenyatta University of Col um, Agriculture and Technology from a Beneza district, as I've been introduced by our parish minister. So when you're talking about maternal health, what do we mean? We are looking at the health of this mother when she's pregnant, at the time of delivery, and after delivery. So we are looking at the whole spectrum of health of that mother. When she gets pregnant through that journey of nine months, that critical period of delivery, and not just that, even up to one and a half months after delivery, that is post the delivery period. We all know that motherhood is meant to be very positive and fulfilling experience. We all get excited when a mother get pregnant, go through that journey and deliver um, a healthy baby and the mother as well is healthy. So it's meant to be a very positive and fulfilling experience for all of us as a community, for that mother, for the husband, um, for the relatives, for everybody would be very happy if somebody can go through the pregnancy period and the delivery and even after that and go home carrying a healthy baby. So it's meant to be a positive. But unfortunately, for many women, as you're going to see in some statistics, it's associated with suffering. They get sick during pregnancy, during delivery and even after. And unfortunately, even some end up dying in the course of bringing life to this world. The mother's um, actually desire is to go through this and bring up life to a newborn baby who is healthy. But unfortunately in the process, there are some who actually even die. 
The good things about this that we're going to see is that most of these causes of these deaths are preventable. And you're going to see that all of us have a role to make sure that this mother go through that period safely without having problems. Unfortunately, again, the deaths and suffering, the statistics are very scaring. These deaths continue um, year after year, especially in our country and developing countries. So how do you define a maternal death? It is the death of this woman while she's pregnant or within 42 days after delivery or termination of that pregnancy, irrespective of the duration, from any cause related to this pregnancy or its management. So if a mother gets pregnant and in the process gets malaria, because it gets severe when somebody is pregnant than non-pregnant women, that is called a maternal death. When a mother suffers from high blood pressure, which is related to this pregnancy, and she suffers um, complications or even death, that is defined as maternal death. So any pregnancy-related death, and even after a delivery, it's what we call maternal death. At the close of the century, we had what we call Millennium Development Goal. And the most important to us in reproductive health is Millennium Development Goal number five. And it was meant to improve maternal health. This was very key. And it was meant to reduce maternal mortality or maternal deaths by 75% and achieve universal access to reproductive health. Unfortunately, this was not achieved. And actually what we are talking about now is um, sustainable development goals. In terms of statistics, what do we have? That if you look at the worldwide, we lose about 358,000 mothers due to pregnancy-related complications. Unfortunately, most of these deaths occur in our countries, the developing countries. Actually, those who have gone to the West or lived in the West, it's very hard to get a maternal mortality or maternal death related to pregnancy. You can actually spend almost five years without getting one case reported. And this is actually reported as breaking news. But unfortunately in our country, this is, happens every, every other day. Every other day we are losing mothers to preventable causes of maternal deaths. So 99% of these deaths of car in our countries, developing countries. Close our home in our country, Kenya, um, the statistics show that we are losing about 488 for every 100 life births. This is about 7,500 deaths every year. These are very high numbers. And remember, these numbers are, are, are underreported because most deaths occur in the village, in rural areas, and they're never reported. So the numbers I'm presenting here are what get to the Ministry of Health and are notified and reported. So the number could actually be very high compared to what actually takes place on the ground. And maternal deaths represent about 15% of all deaths who are of women aged between 15 and 45 years. If you look at the accidents, road traffic accident, HIV, all those kills mothers, yes. But if you look at the maternal mortality related to the pregnancy, it will present 15%. The age between 15 and 45 years in reproductive health is what you call um, reproductive age, is when mothers are actually productive. So you can see we are losing so many mothers. And as I said before, we're going to see these uh, preventable causes of maternal deaths. So as I said before, the Kenya as a country, we did not achieve the Millennium Development Goal number five. I, I bought this slide to highlight some important policy issues that affect maternal health or reproductive health. You can see that the studies from this Dem demographic health survey, uh, this is a survey done in the country after every five years. Uh, in the year 1998, we had 590 deaths per 1,000 life births. And um, in the year 2003, the number dropped to 414. If you remember what happened in 2002, that is when the NAC government came in. And we had a policy change. 
and there was a lot of investment in reproductive health and health in general. There was a lot of recruitment of health personnel. Infrastructure hospitals were built. And we can actually see that just suddenly we had a change in the maternal mortality or maternal deaths from 500 to 414. Look at what happened in 2008, 2009. The number started rising again. Remember, this is when we had post-election violence. And displacement of the population affects mostly the women and the children. And we had a rise in the maternal mortality. So a certain change in the policy and in the political environment can actually affect maternal health. We are happy that the statistics now we have are coming down because of the universal health care and the policy that now mothers can deliver in public hospitals without paying a cent. So the policy change, I brought this slide to emphasize, they need to have a stable environment, political environment for the maternal health and productive health in general. So when you look at this spectrum of maternal health, uh, we start with the antenatal care. Immediately a woman conceives and actually we recommend before they conceive, they should go and visit a doctor or a midwife or somebody who has been trained to take care of maternal health. So why do we encourage mothers to go for what you call preconception care before they, they, they conceive? We want them to enter into their pregnancy when they are healthy. When they come to us, we actually screen them, check for any disease condition and treat it before they get pregnant. There are some supplements we also give to make sure that they don't have complications when they get pregnant. So antenatal care promotes a healthy pregnancy and delivery. And the end goal is to have a healthy baby and a healthy mother. What is the statistics in our country? Currently, about 92% of all pregnant women attend antenatal care. This is a very high percentage. But unfortunately, almost about 43%, although this has now improved to about 60%, of those mothers who attend antenatal clinic come to deliver in health facility. This discrepancy is very significant that you have very high number of pregnant women coming to the clinic for checkup, but very few coming to deliver in health facilities. The statistics are regional, you can see the discrepancy. National 42.6%, you can see very low numbers of women delivering in the Western region. We are fortunate in central Nairobi that we have about 73 and 89% of women coming to deliver. So you can see there's regional discrepancy when it comes to maternal health. So the question we ask ourselves, um, and we don't have good answers, is that why do women come to the clinic, but they don't deliver in hospitals and prefer to deliver at home? One reason is the catch and decision-making process in the family. Remember, there are people who, because of cultural beliefs, they make uh, decisions which are against them delivering in hospitals. There's a cultural belief in some communities that when you go to deliver in the hospitals, those doctors or Takufanya to cesarean section, they're very happy to take you to theater. And that kept keep women from coming to the hospitals. Another problem, maybe not in our setup, but remember we are part of the global community and the Kenyan community as well at large, is that we have people who have difficulty in accessing hospitals because of the distance. The nearest hospital could be like five kilometers away from where they stay. And in the process, they prefer to deliver at home. The cost, as much as I said it's free, there are some cost implications. So there are people who prefer let me deliver with the traditional birth attendant because the only thing they are going to ask from me is kukumoja tu ama mbuzimoja tu pekeake, which I have, they don't have money. So the cost has also kept women away from the hospitals. Our health workers, me included, our attitude is not so good. So in place you go there, a study recently done was that showed that health workers actually harass women who come to deliver. There are some who are abused, there are some who are even pinched, and some are even chased away. So the issue of the attitude of the health workers has kept women away from the hospitals. When you come to the hospitals, you are told to come with a bucket, you are told to come with 
some cotton wool. So we don't have adequate supplies to serve these women adequately. So this lack of supplies, because if I go to the hospital today and I'm asked for everything, why should I go back there in that hospital to deliver? And I'm going to tell somebody else that if you go there, you're not going to be attended. So that has kept women from delivering in hospitals. There's an African proverb that every pregnant woman has one foot in the grave. Unfortunately, it's true. That pregnancy, as much as it's supposed to be something positive, somebody, something to celebrate about, it's actually put some women to the grave and we've lost very many women in the process. For me personally, actually, what made me to become a gynecologist, I remember I was in class two, we lost a neighbor who went to the river in a local hospital and she never, never made it. She bled to death, left the baby, and actually that family was never the same again. There was dropout in schools, the girls got married very early. So that pregnancy, as much as supposed to be a joyous moment, can actually lead these women to grave. So again, there's that proverb from Tanzania that I'm going to the hospital. This is a pregnant woman who is going to deliver, but she's not sure that she might not come back to the family. So she tells the other kids that I'm going to the hospital, I may not come back. Unfortunately, this is true in some situations. So when you talk about safe motherhood, what does it mean? It means that ensuring that all women receive the care they need to have a safe and healthy pregnancy and childbirth. It is the ability of the mother to have safe and healthy pregnancy and childbirth. So that safe journey of pre-pregnancy, pregnancy journey during delivery, 42 days after delivery, that ability to go through it healthy and come out healthy together with the baby is what we call safe motherhood. The goal is to improve the well-being of mothers through a comprehensive approach of providing preventive, promotive, curative, and rehabilitative health care. So what killed these mothers during pregnancy, uh, during delivery, and after? The leading cause of this is bleeding. They can bleed during pregnancy, but the biggest problem is bleeding during, when they are delivering. They start normal uh, bleeding, but when it's excessive, actually kill mothers. And this happens on a daily basis. The other cause of these deaths, we have high blood pressure, which is specific in pregnancy. It's unlike what the blood pressure we know, but this is very specific for pregnancy. And sometimes they even converse, uh, we call it a cramps here. Sometimes, especially young mothers who go to, um, who get pregnant when very early, early age, our teenage girls, the bones are not well developed. And when they go to labor, they have what you call obstructed labor. And actually this kills them. The other one is infections and miscarriages, which are done, the backstreet ones, which we really discourage because it comes with a lot of complications. Um, the infections could be picked from the community, could be picked at the hospital or even after, after delivery. The obstructed labor I'm talking about is maybe this pregnancy, the girl has even not divulge to her parents that she's pregnant. So she goes into labor, she has not attended any clinic, go to labor and is not even lab she's not even able to reach the hospital on time. By the time to come to us, they usually have very bad complications. Sometimes we are talking about deaths, but we also have other complications, not just death. Like when I'm talking about obstructive labor, that mother can labor for three days and deliver a big baby, but unfortunately, Forever, she's going to have leakage of urine unless it's repaired. Sometimes they even have leakage of stool, which is actually a big complication. And sometimes they actually have injury to the nerves and they are not able to, to walk well, what you call a foot drop. So we are not just looking at maternal mortality, but you're also looking at the complications associated with uh, these conditions. Just a pie chart just to show the causes of maternal deaths. So when you're looking at the safe motherhood, we have uh, seven pillars. And the first one is essential obstetric care, antenatal care. Uh, there are those who have abortions complications, could be 
spontaneous abortions or miscarriage. A mother has a pregnancy, it comes off. They need to go to the hospital so that they can be cleaned and be given antibiotics. The uh, care after the delivery, we have neonatal care and prevention of mother to child transmission. This is a mother which is, who is HIV positive. We have strategies in our hospitals which make sure that the baby is born HIV free. The other pillar is clean and safe delivery so that they don't get infections. Antenatal clinic, I talked about it, and family planning when it's needed. So again, as I said, antenatal care should be start at preconception care. And then they come to the clinic and they, we re encourage them to come as soon as they know that they are pregnant. There's a misconception that you don't go to the clinic before six months are over. But there are those complications which can start even before six months. So we encourage them to come early so that we can do uh, some tests. We can check them and uh, diagnose complications before they become uh, severe. The tests we do, we check urine for any infections. We check them for HIV status so that we can intervene so that the baby does not get infected. We check the blood group because blood group is could it be discrepancy, especially if the mother is blood group negative that can affect the baby. We check the level of blood so that we can give them drugs to build their blood before blood level before they deliver. We also check for urine for any infections. And our focus in antenatal care is preventive care. We don't want them to come when it's already too late. We want to intervene before uh, complications set in. So as I said before, the goal of antenatal care is so that you can detect the complications early and conditions and treat them and before they become severe. When they come to us, we take, take them through the danger signs in pregnancy. And I think as a community also, it's good to know this so that we can actually sensitize our women, our girls, on what to look out for in terms of danger signs of pregnancy. The severe headache, the frontal headache, the headache at the front part of the head can indicate that this mother, the blood level is low, can also indicate that she has high blood pressure. So we tell them, if you have severe headache, please come back to the hospital immediately. Any form of bleeding during pregnancy is taken as a danger signs of pregnancy. The mother is the best doctor for the baby. If the mother comes to me as a doctor and tell me my baby is not kicking well, I take that seriously. So reduced fetal movements are another danger signs of pregnancy. And as I said before, the mother is the one who is the best placed to tell you that my baby is not kicking well. If she has swelling of the body could indicate that the blood level is low or blood pressure is going up. If the baby's water breaks and suddenly there's gush of water uh, trickling down the feet, that's another danger signs of pregnancy. And we take them through this so that uh, they understand and they can seek health care before severe complications sets in. We also take them through what we call birth preparedness. And I think as a community also, all of us need to understand this. I think the worst thing that can happen if for our WhatsApp group to be, if for you to be called for a WhatsApp group because so-and-so has delivered and they are not able to raise uh, the money for the normal delivery, which could be maybe, if there's a complication, yes, we understand. But what we are saying that the couple should be taken through the birth preparedness on time, and this happens early in the antenatal clinic. We call it individual, individualized birth plan. They make the choice of the facility. Where am I going to deliver? Am I going to deliver in this government hospital? Am I going to deliver in this private hospital? So that choice is left to the couple to make. We also advise them to arrange for means of transport. If it happens at night, am I going to get to the hospital? So they should have that means of transport. If they don't have a car, they can have the number of a taxi, the Uber, or any means of transport, and that need to be arranged long before the time of the delivery. The person to make that decision that we are going to need to go to this hospital. This might sound that it's obvious, but it's not. I remember in some community I worked in, 
that decision to go to the hospital to deliver is made by my mother-in-law. And actually, I remember one time um, we had to wait. We wanted to make to do a cesarean section emergency, but you had to wait for almost 24 hours before the mother-in-law, who was deep in Somali, to consent and agree that this cesarean section need to be done. Unfortunately, it was too late. We lost them, the baby, and the mother had some complications as well. So that decision-making person is very, very key. We need to arrange in antenatally who is going to make that decision to go to the hospital in case of any intervention, who is going to be consulted to make that decision. Financing is also very key. And who is going to accompany that mother when she goes into labor? It's the mother to choose. Sometimes they choose the husband, a friend, the mother, the mother-in-law, and we let them decide who is going, are they comfortable with to accompany them in that delivery room. Also, very important, male involvement. This is very key throughout the pregnancy journey. That male could be the decision maker. And you need to understand that that man need to be involved in decision making. The pregnancy journey, pregnancy is very stressful. They have complications. All of a sudden, the mother cannot eat. They're vomiting. They have tantrums. They get angry very easily. So that man in that relationship needs to reassure the mothers that that pregnancy complications can be managed. The company I talked about, including coming to the clinic, I like it so much when I get a husband and a wife who comes to the clinic. Unfortunately, most men will come and remain at the reception. They don't come to the doctor's room, but we really encourage them to come so that they can understand what the pregnancy is all about, what do they need to do, and exactly what we need to do. Most families, that man could be the source of income. So they need also to be get involved in the financing of this journey and to help actually, because sometimes the woman is not able to do what she does when she's not pregnant, including the house course, taking care of other kids. So that male involvement is very key and it's something that we are really encouraging. Postnatal care, I talked about it. It's very key. There are complications which are specifically in the post-delivery uh, period. Young mothers, especially first-time mothers, need to be taken through breastfeeding. They don't have an idea. Breastfeeding for the first six, first six months is what we encourage. We call it exclusive breastfeeding. It prevents those mothers, uh, kids from getting infections, getting diarrhea, chest infections. So we really encourage them to breastfeed for six months, exclusive. And they need to be assisted in the hospital by mothers who have been through that journey. Okay. And this is something very, very important. So what challenges do we have in maternal health that cause all these problems? We don't have inadequ uh, adequate staff in our hospitals. The government actually needs to come in because universally, the government should allocate 15% of its total budget to healthcare. Unfortunately, we don't do this, especially now that the healthcare is devolved. So we don't have skilled birth attendant. This is somebody who has been trained to take care of the mother through pregnancy and childbirth. Could be a doctor, could be a nurse, or a clinical officer. Um, we don't have adequate management uh, skills for resource allocations. As I said before, we have stockouts in the hospitals when there are no gloves, theaters are not equipped, okay? And we don't involve the community in maternal health. The community has a very big role in even resource mobilization and sensitizing these mothers on those danger signs. So in our reproductive health, we have what we call the three delay model. And this is one of the reasons why women die. The first delay, is that decision to seek health care. As I said before, people don't have the information. You have a complications, but they don't know these are complications. So they don't seek health care on time. The fact that our women are not empowered. Nowadays, we are not talking about women empowerment, but we are talking about gender equality. Both men and women should be empowered. But in some community, we have low status of women. They are not given the right food to eat. 
uh, they don't have a say, and for this, they are not able to reach the hospitals on time. We have barriers to seeking care, which are cultural, okay, where women are subjected to a lot of um, mistreatment. So these so social cultural barriers to seeking healthcare actually keeps the women from making this decision. So that's the first delay, the delay in decision to seek care. Then we have the second delay. This is now the decision has been made. How do we reach the hospital? Transport problems, infrastructure problems. So that's a second delay. They get to the hospital, that's a third delay. And we don't have adequate supply. We don't have adequate personnel. The person we have are not properly trained and they don't have you know, finances to pay for those services. So they're in the hospitals, there's delay in receiving care and in the process, they get complications. So that's a three delay model, delay in decision to seek care, delay in reaching um, hospital for that care and receiving care in that hospital. So what interventions can we do? Um, I think everybody has a role to play in this. We have health system strengthening. We trained our personnel and equip them and retraining. What you realize in medicine is that it changes very fast. And we saw that with the COVID where every other week something was coming out. So unless we trained our health personnel on new interventions, they are not going to do the right thing. So we need to invest in training. We need to invest in equipment and personnel recruitment. The people who come to the reproductive health, the maternal health we are talking about, come from this cohort called the adolescent. These are young girls uh, between 13 and 19 years who we need to invest so that when they get to motherhood, they are healthy and ready to face that uh, motherhood. We need to give them information on decision making. Remember some things which can happen during adolescent can affect reproductive health like infections, sexually transmitted infections, abortions, which are very common among the youth, drug abuse. So we need to provide them with information so that they make the right, the, the, the right decisions. In our hospitals, we need to have what we call youth-friendly services. Youth-friendly services are not separate from the main hospital services that we have, but we need to have services which are affordable. Most of these young people are in school, they don't have the resources. We need to allocate time, which is um, convenient for them. Most are in colleges. So if I open my clinic at eight and close at five, that student is going to be in school. But it can be flexible so that you can have additional time, like up to 8 p.m. in some days, all over the weekends, so that these adolescents can be able to come and get services. Adolescents don't like being tossed around. I remember at one time when I was doing my training in Kenyatta, you could see a patient on the one end, then they go like a kilometer to get the drugs, then another 500 meters to get counseling. And they get lost in between. Some actually decide to go home. So we need to have what we call um, all in one shop. They get to one room and get all the services. And youth also prefer being attended by their peers or people who have been trained to attend to them so that they understand. These are different times. You cannot tell them that we used to do like this. It's actually very different. The strategy for adolescent health, keep them in school. One of the problems you have in the productive health is when you have early pregnancies before the body has developed. And this strategy of keeping them in school, girls and boys, has worked in actually getting them uh, to mature by the time they get to the pregnancy period. The best age which research has shown to get pregnant is around early 20s to late 20s. Again, we are not looking at those who are now extremes who want to get pregnant after they have gotten their PhD at 35 years, 36 years. This is what we call advanced pregnancy and it has its own complications. They come with hypertension, the sugars are very high and the babies, because the eggs have been there in the body for a long time, can have complications. So it's good to do the right thing at the right time. But that strategy of keeping them in school has actually been known to work. Let's have policies which are youth-friendly. We invest in nutrition, proper nutrition, so that by the time they get to that pregnancy period, they don't have low blood levels. 
gender-based violence is actually a major concern for this and actually has a bearing in productive health. Uh, today, I actually attended a 19-year-old who was uh, assaulted two days ago. She actually asked for an Uber, but the Uber guy turned out to be a rapist and called the other, so she was gang raped. She's very traumatized. We had to take her to theater um, for repair, and this actually affects very many adolescents. Most of them don't report, and for reasons that I mentioned earlier, and this is something that we need to uh, address and counseling as well for adolescent um, youth is very important. So I'm mentioning this so that we can invest in adolescent health so that by the time they get to that pregnancy period, they have healthy bodies and they've made the right decision at the right time. As a community, what can we do? We need to be sensitized on reproductive health issues and I'm happy that this is happening. Um, we need to mobilize resources and invest in reproductive health there are some communities who actually come together and build hospitals and equip them. There are some communities who actually mobilize resources and buy an ambulance so that if the mother has a complications, they can actually get to the hospital on time. Women empowerment or gender equality, as I mentioned before, so that we give them equal opportunities and even in decision making. So when we don't invest in productive health for adolescents, this is what happens. This is a young girl. This story was in the newspaper sometimes back. Uh, a 10 year old who actually gave birth to another baby through cesarean section. So we need to invest in these young girls so that they get pregnant at the right time and avoid complications. So, safe motherhood. We want this mother to have that smile looking at her baby because she made the right time, the right decision to get pregnant. She sought health care on time. She was attended in a hospital by friendly staff in a hospital which was well equipped in terms of personnel and equipment. And she's had a delivery and a healthy baby and she's going home when herself she's healthy. So a happy mother, adolescent, who is ready to face motherhood without any complications. So again, this is a very important topic on this very important day. So to take this opportunity to which all mothers and women a happy women's day that's the end of my presentation thank you for listening thank you thank you so much dr uh, peter igogo one of us uh, in sukari we appreciate the wonderful presentation um very detailed and very clear uh, so we are thankful therefore members we want to engage briefly with our guest tonight for a few minutes so in case you have a question um, kindly um, come up, just uh, uh, mute and speak. If you want to remain anonymous, you can text me on my personal number that I'm going to put on the chat section. Uh, there's those questions that could be sensitive and you don't want to really uh, expose yourself. I uh, will not say who that person is. My number is on the screen, 0734489172. Yeah, you can text me on WhatsApp or text message. However, we have some uh, questions on the chat session. Thank you, uh, Dr. Terry, for the great presentation. Kindly comment about the mothers who get maternal illness after delivery. Sorry, mental, mental illness after delivery. Uh, and then again, we can see Elizabeth Dabi, uh, very informative, Dr. Terry, Asante. Uh, Wanjeri Geshuru, I have a question. If one has a history of severe preeclampsia, does that mean uh, one will have it recurring. Right, Dr. Terry, you can answer this as we look for more. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Edith, mental illness after delivery, it's common, affect about 10% of women after delivery. There are those risk factors for somebody who has had it before or somebody who has gone through the difficult delivery is likely uh, to have mental problem. Um, so it's important that we address those issues uh, so that they don't have complications. But those who actually be, they have a previous history of mental illness in the previous delivery, they can also get it. But the good thing about this, it's something that can be treated and does not take long. Actually, within a few days, this problem just go off. It's not like the mental illness we know, which takes long to manage. This one take a short period. We have psychiatrists, we have counselors, 
who take them through this and they get they recover within no time um the issue of the blood pressure yes one of the risk factors for getting high blood pressure is people who have had it before so what we advise them if you have uh, high blood pressure in this pregnancy the next pregnancy we advise them to come very early so that we can intervene make the diagnosis early and we have drugs actually which you can give which can prevent them from getting hypertension in subsequent pregnancies we start it early after three months and it's a very simple drug actually we use what you call junior aspirin and has been known to prevent them from getting uh, another blood pressure episode in this pregnancy Yes, and there's one here, Dr. Ari, someone is asking, um, they had preeclampsia and their pressure was up. And even after delivery, the pressure has not yet gone down. How can that be managed? Um, a very small percentage, about 5% of women who have eclampsia, that is high blood pressure in pregnancy, end up now having what you call chronic hypertension. In ile blood pressure, sasa tunajua ile nasema ni kona pressure. So we advise them now to visit a physician so that they can be started on treatment. But the good thing is that most people recover within two weeks after delivery. Delivery is actually known to be a treatment for this condition. But there are very small percentage who now go to what we call chronic hypertension, really blood pressure, but they need to be treated by physicians. And drugs are there, and it's important they take the drugs until the blood pressure has stabilized or gone back to normal. Yes, another one is asking uh, a very informative session. Dr. Ari, uh, kindly advice on how to diagnose and deal with postpartum depression. And also another question, a follow-up question. What happens if uh, the aspirin didn't work and still led severe preeclampsia? Uh, postpartum depression is what we talked about, mental illness. Uh, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, the mother get disorientated. They, they, uh, they behave in a confused way, sorry to put it that way, after delivery. Some even refuse to breastfeed the baby. Uh, they become disorderly and noisy. And immediately we notice that. We, we give drugs and we calm them. We call in a psychiatrist and a psychologist to counsel them and give them treatment, which I think in this forum, uh, I, I don't think it's good to go into details about the drugs that we use, but it's something that we can detect, make a diagnosis, and treat on time, and they can go back to their normalized and breastfeed their babies. Uh, the other question, how yes, uh, yes. Uh, what if what happens if the aspirin didn't work and still led to severe preeclampsia? preeclampsia? Okay, aspirin is meant to prevent. But sometimes you are not 100% able to prevent this condition. So we start other drugs which now are able to treat the blood pressure because before it comes uh, severe. The severe form of this blood pressure is conversions. Kifafa, unona mama anapata kifafa. If you go to Kenyatta, it is an acute room called for these patients. And they're actually very sick. Some actually are not even able to, 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 to they're in coma. So we have management to prevent this condition from getting to that uh, complicated, what you call eclampsia. So if aspirin does not work, uh, we advise people to visit the doctor for further treatment. And sometimes we even admit them so that we can monitor them closely. Okay, another one here, Dr. Curry. Um, I developed postpartum depression and uh, Afterwards, I have had an issue, I've had an issue with a child I got. I've never loved them. What should I do? Uh, th thank you very much. I think that's uh, somebody who needs to see a psychiatrist for evaluation. Uh, nowadays, we are happy that mental illness is no longer stigmatized. You can visit a doctor and take them. They, they take you through what you need to do. What you can tell is that it's treatable. Postpartum depression, even when it's prolonged, it actually can be treated. So I'd advise that you visit a psychiatrist so that you're managed and given the right treatment. What the reproductive health, the good thing about it, most of these conditions are reversible. It's rare that you get a condition which cannot be treated. All right. Uh, Molly Moiga, uh, your hand is up. Okay. Uh, thank you.
Peter, Dr. Peter for good presentation. And uh, as the members are raising that issue of mental illness in um, during pregnancy and after, I'm also thinking that when I was looking through the ANC part, uh, some of these grants who also develop a postpartum depression, when you screen them, you realize that they had these symptoms of depression even before uh, delivery of these babies. So is it possible to incorporate assessment of mental illness or mental illness assessment in the ANC package so that we avert these cases of postpartum depression? as a okay. policy issue or uh, as a good practice? I, I agree with you and it's highly recommended. Actually in medicine, what we are now doing, which never used to happen, every patient who is coming to us, we are doing a mental health assessment uh, because mental health, especially during COVID, has come out to be a very important topic and important health issue, which cannot be ignored. So the preconception care I talked about should include mental health assessment. The antenatal package should also have mental health assessment so that we are able to diagnose this early and make timely interventions. So that's a policy issue and I think that's a very good point from Molly. Thank you so very much. Hello? Yes, Panagogi. Yes, yes. Yeah, maybe, uh, uh, thanks for the good presentation, Dr. Terry, but you, didn't mention also the maternal health also contribute to separation and divorce in most cases. Thank you. Uh, very true. And uh, I, 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 it's very true what you've just said. And uh, when you talk about male involvement, okay, you find that if you don't involve the male, they will not understand. So there are women who have been divorced during pregnancy because they are asking for pizza at 2 a.m. Now, when I take a pizza, I talk a pare Java in in Gong, and you're staying in Kasukari, so you don't understand it, and it has led to a lot of uh, marriage issues. So during pregnancy, after delivery, if the man is not understanding uh, because he's not been involved, it can actually lead to separation. The complications I mentioned about leakage of urine and leakage of stool. So many women have been abandoned because of that. And it's very depressing, actually, it has also caused mental illness because you are there trying to bring kids to this family. In the process, you have a complications, but the person now, the man involved, now abandoned you because in the process you had a complication. So most of them end up getting depressed. So I agree with you, Joseph. It has led to separations, but if handled well, and I think as members of this uh, uh, community, we, we can stand out and be mentors so that I can say that I did this so that others can look up to us. Because we have young parents, we have young adolescents, they can look up to us, how we brought up our kids and admire that this family has stood through the challenges. So that mentorship is very important. Uh, it's something I support so that we avoid this issue of separation because of something which maybe is because of misunderstanding. Dr. Terry, maybe a final one here coming, a uh, text message. Um, my Opskine recommended IVF. Is there a second option? Um, IVF, I think just for understanding, is conception not through the natural way. Okay, for people who have problems with conceiving, maybe the, the tubes, the fallopian tubes are blocked, they're not able to conceive naturally. There's an option of now that egg and the sperm being fertilized in the laboratory and the baby introduced in the mother's womb uh, so that you bypass the tube which has a problem. Uh, the options I, options I individualized. This is the end uh, solution for somebody who is not able to conceive. So it's a journey because if somebody, a couple come and they're not able to conceive, there are some tests I do. And remember, the misconception that only women contribute to infertility is not true. Actually, 40% of infertility cases are contributed by men. So we do the test on the man 
you do the test on the woman and identify because there are some problems which can be solved without going through the IVF. So IVF is at the end tail of the journey. And when you come to that now, the doctor will explain to you because it has cost implications. But I can actually tell that there are some women who have gone through IVF and gone home with healthy babies. So it's the end one, but it's something that can be done by doctors, but there's a journey that you have to walk through before you get to that. And some of these conditions can be treated before you get to that IVF. All right, thank you, Dr. Henry. Is there a special treatment for asthmatic preg pregnant women or supplement taking? Um, pregnant asthmatic patients, the much we do is to modify the drugs so that maybe I, I, I forgot to mention that why you encourage women antenatally to come to the hospital is that drugs, there are some drugs which are not safe in pregnancy. It could be asthmatic takes in some drugs, but when you get pregnant, those drugs can be dangerous to your baby. So you need to visit the gynecologist and the physician so that those drugs can be changed. So in asthmatic patients, we change the type of drugs they are taking so that they take those drugs which are safe in pregnancy. And supplements taking is recommended for all women, including the asthmatic ones. So the most important thing is to visit the hospital, tell the doctor, this is my condition, this is what I've been taking. Then they'll advise you to continue if it's safe, if it's not safe, they will tell you to change to these other drugs which are safe for your baby. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Igogo, for the wonderful presentation and also answering questions that have been asked by our members. And tonight, we also have people coming from other denominations, other places. Uh, we are, are glad. Now, as we come to the end of this virtual engagement, I want to call upon our parish minister to close for us. But slightly before we close, just to remind you that next Tuesday, we shall not go dental. Like the parish minister mentioned earlier, we are having a month where we are focusing on health matters. So next Tuesday, we'll have Dr. Pareri, who will take us through dental health. And therefore, uh, join in. The same link remains. So you don't have to ask for the link. Don't have to wait until it's posted. Just use the same link, same time. And uh, you shall uh, benefit from what we are sharing. So asante sana. Uh, God bless us, Mchungaji. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. So, so clear, uh, very broad and informative. We are excited to have you as an asset in our parish. So we would want to invite you again. I'm sure uh, we can also interact with you one-on-one -on -one for those who would want to maybe to visit your clinic. Uh, I'm sure through Dr. Joe, who is your elder, uh, an access can be uh, provided. You will not want, want now to say the grace together. And now may the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ the love and the love of God, God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good night.